Force and Laws of Motion Part 1 In this video, we will get an introduction to forces and learn about balanced and unbalanced forces. For many centuries, people were unable to completely understand the concept of motion. They used to think that the state of rest is the natural state of an object. However, scientists like Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton debunked this theory and developed a completely new approach to understand motion. We have observed that to move an object at rest or to stop a moving object, we need to put in some effort. This effort applied to an object to change its state of motion or state of rest is an example of force. Force can change the magnitude of velocity and the direction of motion. It can also change the shape or size of an object. Now, let us try to understand the concept of balanced and unbalanced forces. Let us do one simple experiment to understand it better. Take a wooden block and place it on a smooth horizontal table. Attach one string on both of the opposite faces of the block. Now, if we apply force by pulling the strings, what do you think will happen? If we apply force by pulling the left string, the whole block will move towards the left direction. In the same way, if we apply force by pulling the right string, the whole block will move towards the right direction. But what do you think will happen if both the strings are pulled with equal forces at the same time? Think about it. That is correct. The block will not move to either side. Since the block is pulled in two opposite directions with equal forces at the same time. The net force becomes zero and hence the block does not move. Such forces are called balanced forces. Here, no changes in the state of rest is observed. Now, what if we pull both the strings with unequal forces? Will the block still remain at rest? In this case, the block will move in the direction of the greater force. If the block is pulled by the right string at a greater force than that of the left string, the extra force on the right string will cause the block to move towards the right. Similarly, the block will move towards the left if the pulling force on the left string is greater than the right string. Such forces are called unbalanced forces. Here, as the forces are not balanced, the block moves, that is, it changes its state of rest. Let us now consider another example of pushing a car on the street. If we push using less force, the car may not move at all. This is due to the friction acting in the opposite direction of the push. Friction arises as the wheels of the car are in contact with the rough surface. Here, the force of friction balances the pushing force and hence the car does not move. To move the car, we need to apply a force greater than the force of friction. That is, an unbalanced force needs to be applied to make the car move. However, some people get the wrong impression that the continuous application of unbalanced forces will keep an object in motion. 
the correct understanding would be any object will maintain its state of rest or state of motion when all the forces acting on it are balanced and the net external force is zero. Which means a change in the state of rest or state of motion is observed only when an unbalanced force is applied. A body at rest may start to move as well as we may stop due to the application of unbalanced forces. An unbalanced force can either change the speed or direction of motion of an object. So, in this video, we got an introduction to forces and learnt about balanced and unbalanced forces. In the next video, we will learn about the first law of motion. Force and Laws of Motion Part 2 First Law of Motion In the previous video, we learned what a force is and what balanced and unbalanced forces are. In this video, we will learn about the first law of motion and see the relation between inertia and mass. Remember, we learned in the last video that scientists like Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton debunked the old ideas of motion and developed a completely new approach to understand it. To understand how the first law of motion came to be, let us first look at the experiments conducted by Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei had a keen interest in mathematics since his childhood. In 1589, in a series of essays, Galileo presented theories about falling objects using an inclined plane. In 1592, he was appointed a professor of mathematics at the University of Padua, where he continued his study of motion on inclined planes and reasoned that objects move with a constant speed when no force acts on them. Let us take a look at an experiment performed by Galileo. He took a marble and released it from the top of an inclined plane. He observed that the velocity of the marble increased while rolling down. Again, he took the same marble and this time tried to make it climb up the inclined plane. This time, he observed that the velocity of the marble decreased as it went upwards. Galileo further argued that if two inclined planes of opposite slopes were kept beside each other, then a marble released from the top of the slope will roll down only to climb up to the same height of the opposite slope. If the angle of inclination of the right plane was decreased, then the marble will go a bit further to reach the same height from which it was released. If the slope is ultimately reduced to zero, then the marble will move forever to reach the height from where it was released. In this case, the unbalanced forces working on the marble is zero. Hence, we can say an unbalanced force is needed to change the motion of the marble but no net force is needed to sustain the uniform motion of the marble. Here, we have assumed that no external unbalanced force is present. However, in practice, the presence of unbalanced forces like frictional forces restrict the motion of the marble. Isaac Newton further studied Galileo's ideas and presented three fundamental laws of motion. These three laws are known as Newton's laws of motion. The first law of motion states that an object remains in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line 
unless compelled to change that state by an applied unbalanced force. This means an object will maintain its original state of rest or state of motion and will resist any kind of change. A football on the ground does not move unless the footballer kicks it and the football going towards the goal will not stop unless the goalkeeper stops it. This tendency of objects to remain at rest or to keep moving with the same velocity is called inertia. That is why the first law of motion is also known as the law of inertia. Let us consider an example of a car. If it suddenly starts moving, your upper body tends to move backwards. This is due to the inertia of rest of our body which opposes the motion and hence does not let our upper body move forward. But the lower body which is in contact with the car moves forward along with the car when the car starts. When the car takes a sharp turn, our bodies tend to move to the opposite side of the turn due to the inertia of motion. Also, when brakes are applied to stop the car, our bodies tend to move forward. This is due to the inertia of motion of our body which opposes any change in the state of motion. That is why safety belts are worn to prevent accidents. Safety belts exert a force that opposes our forward motion and make it slower. Let us do another simple experiment to observe the effect of inertia. Let us take a glass, a card large enough to cover the mouth of the glass and a coin. Place the card above the glass such that it covers its mouth and then place the coin on top of the card. Pull out the card as quickly as possible. Do you think the coin will move along with the card? Well, that might happen if you move the card slowly. But if you pull the card really fast, the coin above it will fall vertically downward in the glass instead of moving along with it. This is due to the inertia of rest of the coin which tries to maintain its state of rest even when the card is removed. From this experiment, we can conclude that a body at rest tends to stay at rest. Through inertia, the bodies offer a resistance to any change in their state of rest or of motion. But do you think all bodies have the same inertia? Let us think of some examples. You can move a football easily by kicking it. But what about a car? Even if you push it with all your strength, it will hardly move. Similarly, you can easily move an empty shopping cart while moving a shopping cart filled with vegetables is a lot harder. That is, we need to put in less effort to move empty carts than carts filled with vegetables. This means that the cart filled with vegetables has a lesser tendency to move than the empty one. Which in turn means that the cart filled with vegetables has more inertia than the empty cart. Accordingly, we can say objects with more mass have more inertia. Thus, the relation between mass and inertia can be stated as follows. Inertia is the natural tendency of an object to resist a change in its state of rest or motion. And the mass of an object is a measure of its inertia. In this video, we learned what the first law of motion is and what the relation between inertia and mass is. In the next video, we will see what is the second law of motion and how it is represented mathematically.
फोर्स एंड लॉज ऑफ मोशन पार्ट थ्री सेकेंड लॉ ऑफ मोशन In the previous video we learned about the first law of motion and saw the relation between inertia and mass In this video we will learn about the second law of motion and how it is represented mathematically We have already learned that due to the application of an external unbalanced force on an object its velocity changes which also means the object gains an acceleration we will now learn how the acceleration of a body depends on the force applied and how we can measure this force let us understand this with some examples in a football match when the footballer kicks a ball the ball moves but the player does not get hurt However, if the player were to kick a rock, the player's leg would get seriously injured. Even when a small object like a cricket ball is thrown with a high velocity, it can hurt a person. These examples suggest that the impact of an object depends on both its mass and velocity. This indicates there may exist a certain quantity that combines the mass and velocity of an object. Sir Isaac Newton introduced one such quantity called momentum. Mathematically, the momentum p of an object is defined as the product of its mass m and velocity v. Momentum is a physical quantity that has both direction and magnitude. The direction of momentum is the same as that of velocity. Momentum is a vector quantity. The SI unit of momentum is kilogram meter per second. We have already seen that the application of an unbalanced force brings a change in the velocity of an object Similarly according to the definition of momentum we can say that the application of an unbalanced force will bring a change in the momentum of an object Now let us consider an example of pushing a car When a person gives a sudden push to the car it hardly moves But if the person continues pushing for some time the car may gradually gain some acceleration and start to move This shows the change in momentum of a body does not only depend on the force but also depends on the time for which the force is applied That is the force that needs to be applied to change the momentum of an object depends on the change of momentum with respect to time based on this concept newton proposed the second law of motion which states that the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force in the direction of force now let us study the mathematical representation of the second law of motion Let us consider an object of mass m is moving along a straight line with an initial velocity u. After the application of a constant force f throughout the time t, its velocity becomes v. We can represent the initial momentum of the object as p1, which is equal to m multiplied to u, and the final momentum of the object as p2. which is equal to m multiplied to v therefore the change in momentum will be equal to p2 minus p1 which can be written as m multiplied by v minus m multiplied by u 
Hence, the rate of change of momentum will be equal to m multiplied by v minus u, which is then divided by t. That is, the applied force is proportional to m multiplied by v minus u divided by t. F is equal to k multiplied by m multiplied by v minus u divided by t, which can be written as k multiplied by m multiplied by a. Here, a is equal to v minus u divided by t is the acceleration gained by the body, that is, the rate of change of velocity with time. The quantity k is a constant of proportionality. The SI unit of mass is kilogram or simply kg and acceleration is meter per second squared. The unit of force is chosen in such a way that the constant of proportionality k becomes 1. According to the formula, we can define one unit of force as the amount of force that produces an acceleration of 1 meter per second squared in an object of mass 1 kilogram. That is, one unit of force is equal to k multiplied by 1 kilogram multiplied by 1 meter per second squared. Thus, the value of k becomes equal to 1. We know f is equal to k multiplied by m multiplied by a. We can now write force as mass multiplied by acceleration. The unit of force is kilogram meter per second squared or Newton which is represented by the symbol N. So, we saw how the second law of motion helps us in measuring the force acting on a body in terms of its mass and acceleration. Let us now look at an example that depicts the second law of motion. In a cricket match, when the fielder catches a fast-moving ball, He pulls his hands backwards after catching the ball. This helps the fielder to increase the time span so that the velocity of the ball can be reduced to zero. This reduces the acceleration of the ball, which in turn reduces the force and impact of the fast-moving ball. If the fielder stops the fast-moving ball suddenly, then the time span to reduce the velocity to zero will be very small. Thus, the rate of change of momentum will be greater and hence, the force that needs to be exerted by the fielder to stop the ball has to be of a greater amount. This impact may hurt the hands of the fielder. Similar examples can be seen in our everyday life. Can you think of any such examples? It is interesting to note that the first law of motion can be mathematically stated from the mathematical expression of the second law of motion. From the second law of motion, we know F is equal to M multiplied by A or F is equal to M multiplied by V minus U divided by T which can be written as F multiplied by T is equal to M multiplied by V minus U. From this equation, we may observe that when F is equal to 0, initial velocity U is equal to the final velocity V. That is, if no unbalanced force is applied, then the object will continue to move with uniform velocity u. Also, if the initial velocity is zero, then the final velocity will also be zero. That is, when no unbalanced force is present, an object at rest will continue to remain at rest. Hence, we saw how the first law of motion can be mathematically stated from the expression of the second law of motion. In this video, we learned about the second law of motion and its mathematical representation.
In the next video, we will learn about the third law of motion. Force and Laws of Motion Part 4 Third Law of Motion In the previous video, we learned about the second law of motion and saw its mathematical representation. In this video, we will learn about the third law of motion. In our previous videos, we saw that the first law tells us how an applied external unbalanced force changes the motion of an object and the second law of motion tells us how this applied force on the object can be measured using its mass and acceleration. Now, Newton's third law of motion says that when one object exerts a force on another object, the second object instantaneously exerts a force, which is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction back on the first object. These two forces always act on two different objects. This means that each object exerts one force on the other object. Or each object experiences only one force. To understand the third law of motion better, let us consider an example. Take the situation of a footballer kicking a football. Here, the ball moves once it's kicked. But the football also applies a force equal in magnitude on the player's leg. We can also observe that this force acts in the opposite direction of the force applied by the footballer. In other words, in any given situation, a pair of forces are acting together instead of just a single force. These two forces are equal in magnitude and they act in opposite directions and also on different bodies. These two opposing forces are commonly known as action and reaction forces. Let us now look at two different examples to understand the third law of motion better. Example 1 Let us consider the case of a bird flying by flapping its wings. When a bird flaps its wings downwards trying to lift off, it creates a force that pushes the air downwards which results in an equal and opposite force that pushes the bird upward and helps it to fly into the sky. Example 2 Now let us consider the case of rowing a boat. While rowing a boat, pulling the oar in the backward direction through the water results in the generation of an equal and opposite force which in turn helps the boat move forward. In these examples, we observe that a pair of equal but opposite forces are acting on two different bodies. We can refer to one of the two forces as the action and the other force as the reaction. Like in the first example, if the bird flapping its wings downwards is the action, then the reaction is the force that helps the bird fly. Similarly, in the second example, the action is pulling the oar backwards and the reaction is the boat moving forward. This provides us with an alternative statement for the third law of motion, that is, to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction.
However, it is important for us to remember that the action and the reaction force always act on two different bodies simultaneously. Consider a situation of you trying to swim. Now, what do you need to do if you want to swim in the forward direction? In the last video, we learned about the second law of motion. From this, we know that to gain acceleration, we need to apply a force. But in which direction should you apply the force here? Is it in the direction you intend to move? No, you need to exert a force in the direction opposite to the direction of swimming. That is, you need to push against the water to move in the forward direction. When you push against the water, the water exerts an equal and opposite force on your body. That is, the water pushes you back such that your body moves in the forward direction. Here, you must note that even though the action and reaction forces are always equal in magnitude, they may not always produce accelerations of equal magnitudes. This is due to the fact that each force acts on a different body that has a different mass. According to the relation derived from the second law of motion, F is equal to M multiplied by A, we can observe that the same force applied on different masses will produce different accelerations. Thus, each force may produce different accelerations on different bodies. Let us look at an example to understand this. Consider the case of firing a gun. Here, the gun exerts a force on the bullet in the forward direction when it fires. According to the third law of motion, the bullet should exert an equal and opposite force on the gun. This results in the recoil of the gun. However, the mass of the bullet is much smaller than the mass of the gun. Thus, the acceleration of the bullet is much greater than the acceleration of the gun. Another example depicting the third law of motion is the bouncing of a ball. When a ball is thrown on the ground, the ball exerts a downward force on the ground which can be referred to as the action force. When the ball hits the ground, the ground too exerts an equal and opposite force on the ball which can be referred to as the reaction force. This reaction force makes the ball bounce off the ground. In this case also, the action and reaction force acts in opposite directions and on different objects. In this video, we learned about the third law of motion. In the next video, we will learn about the law of conservation of momentum. Force and Laws of Motion Part 5 Law of Conservation of Momentum In the previous video, we learned about the third law of motion. In this video, we will learn about the law of conservation of momentum. Just like any other conservation law of physics, the law of conservation of momentum tells us that the total momentum of a system 
is always conserved provided no other external unbalanced force acts on the system. Let us consider an example to understand this statement. Consider two balls A and B having masses MA and MB such that they are traveling in the same direction along a straight line with velocities UA and UB respectively. Also, let us suppose that no external force is acting on these two balls. Let the velocity of ball A be greater than the velocity of ball B, such that the two balls collide with each other after some time. During the time of collision, which, say, lasts for a time period t, the ball A exerts a force FAB on the ball B. Similarly, the ball B exerts a force FBA on the ball A. Again, let us suppose the velocities of the objects A and B after collision are VA and VB respectively. Now, from the definition of momentum, we can say that the momentum of ball A before and after the collision is MA, UA and MA, VA respectively. Then, the rate of change of momentum of ball A which is equal to FAB which is equal to P2A minus P1A divided by T during the collision will be MA multiplied by VA minus UA divided by T. In the same way, we can say the rate of change of momentum of ball B which is equal to FBA which is equal to P2B minus P1B divided by T during the collision to be MB multiplied by VB minus UB divided by T. Now, according to the third law of motion, the force FAB exerted by ball A on ball B should be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force FBA exerted by ball B on ball A. Therefore, mathematically, we can write FAB is equal to minus FBA or MA multiplied by VA minus UA the whole upon T is equal to minus MB multiplied by VB minus UB the whole upon T which gives MA UA plus MB UB is equal to MA VA plus MB VB. Now, MA UA plus MB UB denotes the momentum of balls A and B before the collision and MA VA plus MB VB denotes the momentum of balls A and B after the collision. From the previous equation, we can observe that the momentum of the balls before collision is equal to the momentum of the balls after collision. That is, we can say that the momentum of the balls remains unchanged or conserved provided no other external unbalanced force acts on them. Hence, from this ideal collision experiment, we can state that the sum of momenta of two objects before collision is equal to the sum of momenta after collision provided that no external unbalanced force acts on them. This is known as the law of conservation of momentum. An alternative statement for the given law can be stated as the total momentum of two objects remain unchanged or conserved during the collision. Let us now consider an example to understand the law of conservation of momentum better. Take the situation of firing a gun. Before the firing occurs, both the velocities of the gun and the bullet are equal to zero. After the bullet is fired from the gun, 
it moves in the forward direction with certain velocity. Now, according to the law of conservation, the total momenta of the objects before the firing should be equal to the total momenta of the objects after the firing. Hence, the sum of the momenta of the gun and the bullet after firing should be equal to zero. Then, if the bullet acquires a velocity in the forward direction, then the gun should acquire a velocity in the backward direction. This is observed by the recoil of the gun when the bullet is fired from it. Therefore, the law of conservation of momentum is verified in this case. Several other examples from our everyday life can be observed which follows the law of conservation of momentum. It is important to understand that all conservation laws such as conservation of momentum, energy, angular momentum, charge, etc. are considered to be fundamental laws of physics. These are defined on the basis of experiments and observations. However, we must remember that a conservation law cannot be proved. Any experiment whose result is in accordance with the statement of the law can verify the law but can never prove it. Whereas, if there exists even a single experiment whose result does not follow the statement of the law, it is enough to disprove the law. The law of conservation of momentum has also been deduced from several observations and experiments. It is interesting to know that even though the law was first stated nearly three centuries ago, still not a single situation has been observed that contradicts the law. In this video, we learned about the law of conservation of momentum.